fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, and we're back. And joining us, Harold Schechter, uh, true crime writer. Um, thank you for taking the time to be on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, it's great. Now, um, you know, you've done so much over a period of time here. I don't know where to begin. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah it's um, well. Let's start out with a little bit of your story. Uh, how did you get into doing true crime and serial killer sort of thing? Um, well, years ago. Um, I was uh, writing books on a variety of subjects, and um, uh, I was working on a book about movie special effects. This was like right before computerized effects uh, came into existence, um, and uh, the, the book was divided up. Um, each chapter was divided up, uh, was devoted to a particular genre of movies. Um, so I was working on the horror chapter, and uh, that's when I, uh, it, in the course of my research, discovered that Psycho and Texas Chainsaw Massacre had, had both been based on this actual case that I was unfamiliar with. Um, so we're talking about, I guess, uh, that book really going back to like 19, late 1980s or something I was working on. Um, anyway, uh, I was very fascinated by that and, um, uh, and pitched this idea um, for a book about Ed Gein, you know, the, the original psycho, the real life Norman Bates, right. uh, to my editor, and, um, and she was interested in it. So, you know, I wrote that book, and uh, that book did well. Um, so I kind of decided to pursue that particular um, subject. Which you know, I've, I've had a, I'm a baby boomer, you know, so I, I grew up, you know, completely steeped in this culture of horror movies and horror comics and you know horror Friday night horror TV shows. So uh, you know, it sort of suited my temperament to write about these real life monsters. Um, and uh, and when I was researching the Ed Gein book. Uh, I was in touch with Robert Block, um, who wrote Psycho, and uh, I asked him uh, why he thought people were so fascinated by it being, and he, he responded and said, because they forgot about Albert Fish. Um, and that led me to look into the case of Albert Fish, and you know that became my next subject, uh, the subject of my next book. Anyway, one thing led to another, and before I knew it, I was um, kind of... Uh, uh, an expert in the field of uh, Amer historical American serial murderers. So. I, I noticed now in the um, you have the Encyclopedia of Serial Killers A to Z, um, and the phenomenon of serial killers didn't really start with Jack the Ripper, did it? It's something that's been going on a long time. Um, well, you know, I just uh, was invited to give a lecture at this uh, little museum in Brooklyn called the Museum of Morbid Anatomy. And um, uh, it's a lecture that I've given before. I originally gave it to a group of New York City medical examiners, um, you know, maybe a dozen years ago. Uh, anyway, the title of the lecture is A History of Serial Murder from 1 Million B.C. to the Present. Um, and uh, even though the date of million, 1 million BC is a rough estimate, um, the point of my, of my title and of the lecture is that what we now call serial murder is an age-old human phenomenon. You know, there have always been uh, the kind of uh, homicidal sadists uh, that we now call serial killers. Um, 
they used to be called different things, um, but, you know, the phenomenon itself is, well, probably not only as old as the human species, but probably predates the human species. Uh, one of the points I make in my lecture is that, you know, recent primatologists who have closely studied chimpanzee behavior uh, have discovered that chimpanzees, uh, to which we are, you know, genetically very, very closely related, we share something like 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees, um, we're genetically closer to chimpanzees, and chimpanzees are gorillas. Um, and chimpanzees, you know, routinely uh, commit the kinds of atrocities that we now associate with serial killers. You know, they will mutilate and cannibalize and vampirize um, other chimpanzees. So, yeah, it seems to be hardwired in our DNA. And... Um, and so, yes, uh, you know, you can find instances of serial murder going back, you know, all throughout recorded history and suggestions that it certainly existed even in our prehistory. Why do certain serial killing murders or certain things happen and they stick out and they stay with us for mm -hmm. years? Like Jack the Ripper, for instance. Why is it mm -hmm. certain, certain ones yes. do and other ones don't? Yeah, no, that's a question that's always interested me. Um, you, you know, I mean, uh, not just serial murders, but, you know, there are certain criminals uh, who uh, not only rip the public imagination, but, you know, retain that hold on the public imagination of generations and, and really even enter into the national mythology, something like, let's say, uh, Lizzie Borden or Leopold and Loeb, you know, Leopold and Loeb, the crime they committed, heinous as it was, was not any more horrendous than other kidnapping murders that occurred back then. Um, you know, but something about something about the characters, something about the nature of the crime. I mean, I think that um, there are particular kinds of criminals who have this, again, for a combination of reasons, they come to have this larger than life quality to them. Uh, sometimes I think it's because they seem to be the living flesh and blood incarnations of certain kinds of fears um, that are common to the culture at that particular time. Uh, so that, for example, again, speaking about Leopold and Loeb, um, you, you know, they I think they symbolize uh, to America at that time, um, you know, the, the what they used to call the flaming, you know, the wild, flaming youth of the 1920s um, who were completely out of control in the same way that Charles Manson, you know, came to symbolize all the, you know, nightmarish fantasies about sex and drug-crazed hippies in the 1960s. You know, so you get these figures, these murderers, who take on a kind of almost symbolic, mythic status. Uh, and again, the same holds true for certain serial killers. Um, so again, somebody like Ed Gein, you know, he, he seemed to be one of these fairy tale cannibal ogres uh, come to life. You know, well, it's very, very common for children to imagine that, uh, you know, there's like some cannibal ogre living in some remote house, you know, dark, creepy house in their neighborhood. Um, and, of course, usually it's just some harmless, eccentric person. Um, but in the case of Ed Gein, you know, that kind of folk figure, like, you know, that nightmarish folk figure turned out to be real. So, you know, the, if it becomes hard to separate the real-life criminal you know, from this kind of mythic fantasy about him. Um, anyway, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's what I think. Yeah. And now... In other words, it's not just, in other words, it's not just the grisliness of the crime. It has something to do with the character of the killer, you know, what the, what the killer seems to symbolize. And, you know, and also the sort of story that surrounds it. You know, we, we read about... We read about these, you know, reading true crime. True crime is a form of entertainment. Um, and, you know, to be entertaining, you know, it has to have the same ingredients that makes 
you know, a movie or a Broadway show or a TV show entertaining, you know, a certain kind of gripping character, a certain kind of gripping story, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, I was th- thinking that, too. With Lizzie Borden, it wasn't that severe of a... Of a I mean, it's not, mm-hmm. you know, it's not a good thing, but it wasn't that yeah. that, that wild or that, that anything too yeah. freaky, especially there's so many stories you hear since, but they're still making yeah, movies, exactly. you know, it's still out there. Um, and, and, and things like, uh, now I know you've got a book coming out, Maneater, and um, uh-huh. it's really sort of about cannibalism in a way, and, uh, and certainly Hannibal in the movie and the TV series have um, certainly shown popularity, so that's another subject that kind of keeps mm-hmm. in interest. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your um, upcoming book, Maneater? Uh, well, Maneater is a book about Alfred G. Packer, who's a very, very uh, uh, more kind of legendary figure um, out in the American West, particularly in Colorado. Uh, which is where his crimes were committed. Uh, he was um, a miner who went prospecting with a bunch of other guys, and you know they got they got uh, lost um, in the in the wilderness in, in the winter, and um, uh, he him alone. Uh, there were six of them all together, and uh, after uh, they disappeared, like several months after they disappeared, um, when the when the snow had melted. And the weather warmed up. He emerged from the from the from the wilderness, from the mountains, and uh, looking very well fed. Um, and it turned out he had spent the last few months uh, snowed in and living off the flesh uh, of these other five men. Um, and he was accused um, of um, you know sometimes you read accounts. One of one of the purposes of, my, of all my books really is to try to separate myths from uh, fact. Um, And, you know, even now, if you Google Alfred Packer, you'll come across these web pages that claim he was the only man ever uh, tried and convicted of cannibalism in U.S. history, which is not the case. Um, Cannibalism itself, actually, is not illegal in in almost every state of the Union. Um, But he was tried and convicted of murdering these five guys in order to feed off their bodies. Um, anyway, I mean, it, it's a very, very fascinating story. He was initially sentenced to death, and then that was overturned, and he was retried and sentenced to life in prison, and ultimately, uh, 20 years later, managed to get paroled. Um, but as I said, he's, he's a, kind of a, one of these mythic figures of the Old West, and I've uh, been interested in this story for a while. So, hmm. How do you get... Um into the uh, certain ones that you write about? Like, how does it that you come across them? Is it just by accident or...? Um... Well, different ways. I mean, again, initially, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I stumbled upon the Ed Gein story um, from researching the movies, and then I got to Albert Fish, basically, because Robert Block mentioned them to me. Um, but, you know, once I began to really immerse myself in the, in the history of uh, American serial murder, you know, there are different reference books that existed back then. You know, you start to come across uh, these different figures. Um, you know, my third book was about H.H. H. Holmes. Um, actually, very few people know this, but Robert Block also wrote a novel based on Holmes, um, and it was partly through that that I came upon Holmes. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, at this point, I, I have a pretty, pretty thorough knowledge of, um, you know, the major figures and, you know, ones that have been written about to death, but other figures who were very notorious at the time, but have kind of been forgotten about. Um, but I, I'm sort of, I'm, I would just write about serial murders. I mean, lately I've been writing, I guess, about mass murders. Um, you know, uh, the Packer was not a serial killer. Uh, he was a mass murderer. He killed five people all at once. Uh, my last book, called The Mad Sculptor, was about a very infamous triple murder that happened in New York City in 1937. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I come across... I mean, I, I lived in Colorado for a year, so I, I was about, well, probably almost 30 years ago now. Uh, so I was very aware of Alfred Packer from that, and I've been wanting to write a book about him for a while. 
How long does it take you to actually um, research and, and put together one of these books? It was held together maybe about a year and a half. Um, you know, my writing uh, routine, which has pretty much remained the same for the last 30 odd years, is I, I write like a finished page in a day. <laughs> Um, so, you know, basically writing the book, you know, writing a 350 page book, since I basically write every day, you know, it takes about a year. And then, uh, the research, you know, it takes a few months. So, I mean, the initial research, I mean, I, I continue to research while I'm writing, uh, but the initial research before I launch into the book, you know, it might take three months or something like that. So, I mean, roughly a year and a half. Hmm. And um, so now I've noticed um, on that Mad Sculptor, it was a nom- mm-hmm. it was nominated for an Edgar Award for 2015. So that's quite a, yeah. a thrill, I, mm-hmm. I would say. Um, yes, it was. Yeah. Uh, so uh, on, on things like that, um, do, you, do how, how how am I going to say that? So does it does it affect the way you write? Um, uh, what, what does what affect the way? Like, right? like when you get um, nominated, or if you're if you're writing and things like that, does that sort of change so, then when you write your next book? No, no. I don't think so. Um, yeah, no, I, I I think you know I've been doing this for a long time. Um, next week is my sixty seventh birthday. Um, I've been writing these books uh, basically. You know, I've been writing them like for thirty years or something. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anything really changes too much. Um, you know, as I said, I, I, I have my usual routine and, and, uh, you know, I, I basically know what I'm trying to do and so on. So now, um, I've also noticed now, so, uh, I had, uh, Lee Mahler on and he does serial killer. Huh? Qu- we had Lee Mahler on the show. Yes. Who does yeah, yeah. serial I've, killer? I've, totally. I've, yeah. So you? Yes, um, I, I've met Lee. I've met Lee. Lee uh, came to uh, Brooklyn um, uh, a couple of years ago and uh, had dinner with him. Uh, very nice guy. And yeah, I've uh, contributed a couple of pieces to Serial Killer Quarterly, which is a very impressive publication. I think. Yeah, it looks quite good. It's done quite well. Um, yeah, yeah, do, you, really. do you have any influences in the business as well? Like any other um, writers that really sort of um, um, that you can't oh. can't wait to read? Or um, yeah, you know, I can't say that I. Well, I mean, you know, obviously one of my main early influences is, I assume, probably is true of anybody who writes true crime. You know, over the last fifty years was uh, Capote's In Cold Blood. Um, and, of course, you know, I've read over the years, you know, there have been many serial killer books that I've admired. Uh, Joe McGinnis's Fatal Vision and Norman Mailer's Executioner Song. Um, I, I don't tend to, and, you know, some more recent ones. Um, there's a very good book. Uh, I, uh, well, actually, a book that ended up also being nominated for Edgar Warren this year, I, I found myself uh, being in competition with this person. Uh, Kevin Cook uh, wrote a book about a Kitty Genovese murder uh, that I liked. So, you know, every now and then one will, one will come along uh, that will catch my attention, partly because, you know, I'm interested in the, in the, in the story. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that in terms of, again, how I approach my books or structure my books and write my books, uh, I have a particular influence. I mean, I, I, I tend to, in a funny kind of way, when I'm writing or conceiving my books, tend to be more influenced by movies um, because I often think of how I want to present different scenes of my books um, in, in relation to like how some of my favorite horror movies have been uh, assembled or edited, um, you know, because, you know, again, in the, you know, the main task of, of somebody who does this kind of writing, you know, is to take a bunch of uh, dry documents and turn them into compelling narratives. So, you know, I, I, I try to see 
you know, how often, as I said, I, I find myself thinking about movies more than other books when I'm trying to uh, figure out how to create tension or create suspense or something like that. Right, right. And now, um, I uh, also, uh, in your A to Z or encyclopedia, um, uh -huh. you, you sort of cover people that... Um, aren't so famous uh who, mm -hmm. you, who, who was the most uh, i would say interesting one that isn't so famous that isn't so famous well um well actually uh not so much in psycho usa i mean the uh, agency encyclopedia but i did a book a few years ago called psycho usa famous american killers you've never heard of um and and in a way that that whole book is is an answer to your question um, because, uh, you know, I, I, you know, just in the course of my research over the years, I would come across the cases of various serial killers, some of whom at, at the time, you know, were very, very, you know, the cases were very, very sensational and attracted a lot of media attention, um, but then faded from public awareness. Uh, so, uh, you know, then I decided to, to, you know, write a bunch of uh, small, you know, like 10 page, uh, essays about each one of those. And there were a number of them. I mean, it's as if the whole book is full of them. Um, so, uh, you know, there were a couple of, uh, late 19th century American, um, sex killers. Uh, there was a guy, um, named Franklin Evans. He was known as the Northwood murderer, uh, who, um, you know, he was a classic sexual mutilation murderer uh, who killed uh, a number of women and then ended up luring his own niece uh, into the woods. This was in New Hampshire. Um, you know, he told her he was going to show her, you know, how to trap partridges. And, uh, you know, he ended up um, raping her and beheading her and cutting out her vulva. Um, and, and again, at the time, it was, you know, this big sensational case. Um, there was a, uh, there was a, a guy named Anton Probst, also late 19th century, who very methodically slaughtered, uh, the entire family, um, this farming family that he'd worked for and had treated him, you know, very, very well. He just lured one of the, uh, you know, one after another of them, there were seven of them, into the barn under some pretext and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, killed them with an axe. So, so yeah, I mean, there. As I said, this my my book is you know is full of these horrendous cases that people have never heard of. I was going to say also your um, your um, whole death catalog. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank that's, you. Yeah. That, that's yeah. A, that's an interesting uh, subject. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Why don't yeah. you tell them a little bit about that? Um, well, you know, uh, I guess uh, you know sometimes. Well, I, you know, years ago when I was in graduate school, um, some of the best advice I ever got um, was from my uh, PhD director, who advised me to always follow my obsessions. <clears throat> so uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, you know, there was a particular moment uh, where I was in the grip. I guess there was some kind of midlife crisis thing, um, of a particular life, you know, obsessive thoughts about death and so on. So uh, I decided to get that out of my system um, by writing this book about death, which I figured, you know, I figured it was uh, correctly, I think, um, for people in my generation, it was uh, going to become a, a hot topic. <laughs> um, you know, since, you know, that's the next big thing, unfortunately, we're facing. Uh, so, yeah, so I uh, started this book, The Whole Death Catalog, and based sort of everything you probably didn't want to know about death. Um, um, but, you know, once I launched into it, I discovered, and I guess I should have foreseen this, that it was a much, 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 much broader topic than I could possibly deal with um, in just one book. So anyway, I ended up writing this book, which you know, I think is a, you know, kind of a, a lighthearted, in many ways, um, book about um, everything about death beginning with why we have to die and then how we die and, you know, the various stages of decomposition 
um, and uh, you know, but also practical matters in terms of burial and funeral arrangements and cremation. You know, it, it contains the history of death. There's a, a cultural aspect to it. You know, there are chapters on death literature and death poetry. So yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a, a, a light-hearted but serious and I hope uh, uh, useful kind of compendium about death-related uh, subjects. Yeah, and uh, I guess what wacky wills, you can't take it with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, now it looks like you're giving a little class coming up here in August. Um, what's that about? Uh, yeah, well, assuming I get enough students who register for it, um, uh, there's a, uh, a place in Provincetown, um, uh, Cape Cod, called the Fine Arts uh, Workshop. No, let's say the Fine Arts, well, anyway, something like that. Um, and my wife, who's a very fine poet, has actually taught workshops there for a number of years, and this year I was invited to do one on um, narrative nonfiction. So, yeah, as I said, uh, assuming I get a sufficient number of students, I will be doing a workshop on narrative nonfiction there. Fantastic. So um, what, yeah. do you got, what do you got coming up in the future? Just, uh, I guess, Maneater comes out in August. Um, are you going to be... Maneater comes out in August, and I'm, I'm hoping to start a book about uh, Belle Dennis, um, who is the uh, Lady Bluebeard of La Porte, Indiana, uh, who murdered, who lured a bunch of, uh, lured a bunch of uh, guys to her farm um, under the pretext of marrying them and, uh, and then uh, ended up killing them. She's one of uh, America's most infamous female serial murders. You know, I'm interested in the whole subject of female serial murder. I did a book about I guess only one of my books so far has been devoted entirely to a woman serial killer, a book I did years ago called uh, Fatal, uh, about Jane Toppin, who was a nurse back in the turn of the 20th century who murdered uh, 31 people. I mean, she uh, was in a, until John Wayne Gacy came along. The Guinness Book of World Records has her as America's most prolific serial killer. So uh, female serial killers aren't that common. Well, actually, that's a common misconception. I mean, you know, if, if you think of a uh, serial murderer being like, you know, Jack the Ripper, you know, that kind of uh, sexual mutilation murderer, then yes, uh, there probably are really no, you know, almost no females who fit that model. Um, but my own feeling is that's that's not, that's just the male form of serial murder, um, and you know, and it and it, and it reflects. You know, in, in my definition, serial murder is what used to be called lust murder, like Jack the Ripper, for example. You know, when you think of most, uh, you know, the very very infamous serial murders of the late twentieth century, uh, Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy or Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, you know, these are uh, you know they're, they're sexual sadists. You know, they're, they're, those are sex crimes. Uh, and male serial murder um, reflects the patterns of male sexual behavior, um, which is, you know, again, very phallic penetrative and indiscriminate. You know, these guys just build up a, an urge to, you know, torture and kill somebody. And then you go out and, you know, troll for a victim and pick up somebody in the bar or whatever, you know, or lure them to their house for some sexual you know, sexual uh, liaison and then torture and kill them. Um, if women serial killers, again, women serial murder is also often a sexual crime. It's just that it reflects, you know, a different kind of female sexual pattern. Um, and so women serial murderers tend not to murder strangers. Um, you know, they like to have a, a relationship with you before they kill you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so they will often, you know, generally murder uh, family members or friends or children or siblings. Um, and again, they don't use this phallic penetrative way. They don't chop up people with knives and stuff. You know, they tend to, well, in a sense, nurture them to death. Um, you know, they tend to feed them poison and so on. Um, which is often, you know, a more sadistic form of murdering somebody than killing them uh, with a knife. You know, I mean, as hideous as 
the mutilations that Jack the Ripper perpetrated on his victims were, you know, they were all done post-mortem. He actually, you know, killed his victims very, very swiftly, um, whereas somebody like Jane Toppin, you know, took this very, very depraved and, you know, admittedly sexual pleasure out of slowly uh, subjecting her victims to this, you know, protracted, agonizing death. And then she would get into bed with them when they were dying and, you know, have an orgasm while she was holding them while they were having their death throes. So, and, and, and again, there have been many, many uh, of those kinds of sadistic female poisoners. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I you know, my, my feeling is there, there's actually, I, I've become acquainted with a guy named Richard Stevens. Your, your listeners might be interested. He has a, a web uh, blog called The Unknown the unknown history of misandry. Uh, misandry is, you know, the equivalent, of, well, it's the, the female version of misogyny. You know, misogyny is the fear and hatred of women. Misandry is the fear and hatred of men. And uh, on his blog, he's done a lot of research, and he's dug up hundreds of cases of female serial killers. So, um, yeah, anybody interested in that topic, I recommend that blog. Hmm. Sounds interesting. Um, yeah. So, um, do you ever get involved in like the um, kind of the serial killer debates, as in uh, like who the uh, Zodiac really was or who Jack the Ripper mm. really was? Do you ever do you ever sort of have opinions and kind of get involved in that? No, I mean, I you know keep up with the latest theories, um, but I mean, I don't enough. You know, I mean, you know, when you, when you have cases like that, I mean, there are people who you know, devoted, I mean, really, you know, fanatical interest in that. I mean, there are people who, you know, that is their life, you know, um, you know, these ripperologists, as they call them, yeah. uh, or some of these Zodiac people, you know, they end up, um, obviously, you know, knowing a great deal more about those topics than I would. Uh, so, you know, I have no, you know, no particular informed opinion of that. I mean, you know, those are... You know, if I want to learn about the Zodiac or write about the Zodiac, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll turn to those people for, you know, for my research. So. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much. Um, what's your uh, contact information for any of the listeners that want to get a hold of you or um, send you a message? Or uh, Well, there is a Facebook page. Um, so, yeah, that would be, you know, that would be the best way of doing it. Okay. Well, um, I want to thank you very much for taking some time to uh, be on our show. Well, I uh, appreciate your inviting me. show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.